The Authority of the Fathers Excerpts taken from A Manual of Patrology by the Rev. Bernard Schmidt, Order St. Benedict, freely translated from the 5th German edition by a Benedictine, and revised with notes in addition for English readers by the Right Rev. Monsignor V. J. Schobel. Neil Obstadt, F. J. Holwick, 1898, Imprimatur, John J. Kane, Archbishop of St. Louis, 1898. Chapter 1. Ecclesiastical Writers, Fathers, and Doctors In a general sense, the name ecclesiastical writer, as distinguished from inspired writer, may be given to all those who, ever since the days of the Apostles, have written an explanation or defense of the Christian doctrine. But in the narrower or specific sense, ecclesiastical writers differ from those who are called fathers or doctors of the church. The difference derives from the character of their lives and writings. Ecclesiastical writers are called those men who, though living in the communion of the church, have yet not always in their lives and writings expressed her pure and genuine traditional doctrine, as, for instance, Origen, Tertullian, Rufinius, Theodoret of Cyrus, and others. If St. Irenaeus, in spite of his Chalistic opinions, and St. Gregory of Nyssa, in spite of his Originistic ideas, are counted among the fathers, it is because they did not propound their opinions as the teaching of the Church. The Christians who have left behind writings on matters of faith, but did not live in the communion of the Church, as for instance Novatian, are called Christian writers. Fathers of the Church By fathers of the Church are understood those ecclesiastical writers of old who, on account of their learning and holiness of life, have been recognized as such by the Church. Four conditions are necessary for a father of the Church. Antiquity, ecclesiastical learning and orthodox doctrine, holiness of life, approbation of the Church. Antiquity Patrologists are not all agreed as to this condition. Some close the patristic period with the 4th, others with the 6th, others with the 14th century, whilst others, again, entirely object to any limitation of time, for, as Muller says, there must be fathers of the church as long as the church herself lasts. But according to the more common opinion, the patristic age is most appropriately closed with the end of the Greco-Roman period, so that Isidore Seville, 636, may be considered as the last father of the West, and John Damascene, the last of the East. Ecclesiastical Learning By this condition are excluded not only anti-Christian and heterodox, but also those Christian writers who have held and propounded erroneous views, or distinguished themselves in profane rather than ecclesiastical knowledge. As regards the extent and measure of the knowledge required, it is not so much the depth or comprehensiveness of learning that is to be considered, as rather the fact that the writings of a father are of great importance for some point or other of ecclesiastical science. Holiness of Life This condition is absolutely required in a father of the Church, for there exists an internal connection between true ecclesiastical learning and personal sanctity, and only those who can be considered as fathers who have helped to produce and to fashion the spiritual life of the Church, not merely by their writings, but also by their example. Approbation by the Church This approbation may be formal or explicit, as, for instance, by a general council, or by the Pope as supreme teacher of the Church, or only tacit and implicit by the mere consent of the Church dispersed throughout the world. This condition is no less necessary than the other three, for the doctrine taught by the fathers can only claim authority inasmuch as the church herself considers their writings, so to speak, as her classics, and the father themselves as her own witnesses to the divine tradition. Nevertheless, this approbation by the church does not imply freedom from every error. It only testifies to the fact that those men who she recognizes as fathers have lived to the end of their lives in constant communion with her, have distinguished themselves by piety and orthodox doctrine, and are, in consequence, perfectly trustworthy witnesses to her belief and teaching. 
the fathers may be divided, according to language, into Greek and Latin, according to authority, into greater or lesser, according to age, into apostolic, as Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Ignatius, and others, bring us up to about the year 150, ancient or early, as Justin, Uranaeus, or Cyprian, and others till the end of the 3rd century, and later fathers, as Gregory Nazianzen, Epiphanius, Hilary of Portiers, Paulinius of Nola, Caesarius of Aries, and all others from the 4th to the 8th century. Doctors of the Church By doctors of the Church we mean those ecclesiastical writers who, on account of their learning and holiness, have been expressly honored with this title by the Church. Therefore, in a doctor of the Church are required eminent ecclesiastical learning, remarkable holiness of life, express approbation on the part of the Church. The condition of antiquity is not necessary, as the Church can at all times distinguish with this honorable title men eminent for piety and orthodox learning. The Greek Church has her doctors as well as the Latin. Amongst the Greeks are Athanasius, who, however, is not entered as a great ecumenical doctor in the Greek liturgy. Basil, Gregory Nanzianzen, and Chrysism. Amongst the Latins, Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and specifically styled the Great Doctors of the Church. Later on were added to them, by Pius V, Leo the Great, and Thomas Aquinas, by Pope Sixtus V, Bonaventure, by Pope Pius VIII, Bernard of Clairvaux, by Pius IX, Hilary of Portiers, Alphonsus of Liguri, and Francis of Sales, by Pope Leo XIII, Cyril of Jerusalem, Cyril of Alexandria, and John Damascene. Others, also like Isidore of Seville, Anselm of Canterbury, Peter Chrysologus, Peter Damian, are honored by the Church as doctors in her liturgy, inasmuch as they have the antiphons proper to doctors and credo in the mass of their feasts. Narrators note, St. Bede the Venerable, St. Ephraim, St. Peter Cantius, St. John of the Cross, St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Albert the Great, St. Anthony of Padua, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Therese of Lisieux, St. John of Avila, St. Hildegard of Bigen, have all been added as doctors of the Church since the publishing of this book. End narrator's note. The Authority of the Fathers in General By authority, as attributed to writers, is meant their power and right to command intellectual assent. It is a moral power, affecting the mind and will of the reader, determining his judgment, and obliging him to assent to the words or statements of the writer. This authority varies in degrees. It may be greater or less, and even absolute, according as it is calculated to produce in the mind a more or less probable or a certain assent. The authority of the fathers has been very differently estimated at different times. Some few, after the example of the abbot Ferdeches in the ninth century, placed their authority on a level with that of the prophets and apostles, while others, on the contrary, especially Protestants, beheld in the writings of the fathers mere literary testimonials of no paramount importance in matters of faith but the greater number of theologians have determined the authority of the fathers by the following rules. In the matters of natural science, the words of one or many or of all the fathers together have only as much weight as the reasons on which they are based. Tantum valent quantum probatum, i.e., their authority extends no farther than their proofs. Even in matters appertaining to faith or morals, the testimony of one or two fathers of the Church does not suffice to produce certainty, but only probability. The same holds good of the authority of many fathers, in cases where other fathers contradict or hold a different opinion. But the agreement of all the fathers of the Church, together, consensus patrum, in matters of faith and morals, begets complete certainty and commands assent, because they, as a body, bear witness to the teaching and belief of the infallible Church representing the Church herself. The consensus, however, 
needs not be absolute. A moral agreement suffices, as, for instance, when some of the greatest fathers testified to a doctrine of the Church, and the rest, though quite aware of it, do not positively oppose it. Whatever, therefore, the Holy Fathers unanimously teach as the divinely revealed tradition of the Church must be accepted and believed as such. He who departs from the unanimous consent of the Fathers departs from the Church. He who rejects the Holy Fathers confesses that he rejects the whole Church. The things that are drawn from the unanimous mind of the Fathers possess a firm and invincible force against adversaries. The binding authority of the consensus patrum in rebus fidei et morum rests both upon a natural and supernatural basis. Natural or historical basis. As men of great ecclesiastical learning, they are able to know and testify to that which the Church believed and taught in their times. As honest and holy men, they were willing to bear witness to the truth. And finally, their agreement with each other is a guarantee for the truth of their testimony. This may be called their natural and historical authority. Supernatural Basis The fathers give their testimony as the expression of their own faith, and due subordination to the supernatural power and authority of the teaching church, and under her constant supernatural supervision. The church, moreover, approves, confirms, and authenticates their testimony, inasmuch as she acknowledges them as orthodox teachers, and appeals herself to their unanimous testimony as proof incontestable of her doctrine. This may be called their supernatural authority. Although the supernatural authority of the consensus patrum rests ultimately upon the infallibility of the church, nevertheless their testimony may, without fear of a vicious circle, be invoked also in favor of doctrines for which there exists no authoritative pronouncement by the church. For, in the first place, their consistent teaching is in itself an equivalent of the authoritative teaching of the church, and, in the second place, their authority, as competent historical witnesses of belief and tradition, is independent of the church, and is derived from the natural principle of philosophy, that the unanimous testimony of men, capable of knowing the truth and willing to tell it, is trustworthy and deserving of credence. THE AUTHORITY OF SINGLE FATHERS The authority of single fathers in matters of faith or morals is not in itself supreme or absolute, as if their dicta were infallible, but to reject it, except for very grave reasons, would hardly be justifiable, particularly if a father represents a doctrine not merely as his own private opinion, but as the teaching of the church the latter in the case when the fathers expounded and defended their opinions as undoubted truths of the faith, or denounce as heretics those of an opposite opinion, or make use of such words as are equivalent to a profession of faith, vis-a-vis, -vis, we believe, we have been taught, Christ has said, the apostles have handed down, the church believes or holds, and the such like. For the rest, the individual fathers are not all of equal authority. The various degrees of authority may be determined by the following rules. 1. The greater the holiness and learning of a father, and the greater the honor in which he is held by the church, the greater is his authority. 2. Those fathers who were in close connection with a great number of bishops, or who lived near to the times of the apostles, have greater authority than others less favorably placed. Again, those surpass others in authority who, by their special treaties, have successfully defended any assailed dogma of the Church and brilliantly explained its meaning, such as St. Athanasius, Augustine, and Hilary. 3. A preeminent authority are those fathers who were at the head of churches founded by the apostles themselves, such as St. Clement of Rome, Ignatius, Polycarp, or who were successors of St. Peter, as St. Leo the Great and St. Gregory the Great, or who were preferred by the Holy Fathers themselves before others. Those again rank higher in authority who received a special praise from the Church, 
or whose virtues were especially recommended by other devout and learned bishops, or whose works have been publicly read and approved by general councils. The Authority of the Fathers on Questions of Faith and Morals The Fathers, and their unanimous consent, are the venerable organs and the fully competent witnesses. So far as the fathers of a certain period are all, or mostly, bishops, their testimony and matters of faith and morals is not only indirectly, but directly, and in itself infallible, because they are the divinely appointed witnesses and the divinely instituted organ and channel of tradition. Of the revealed doctrine of Jesus Christ deposited in the church and handed on by her from generation to generation, for, as St. Augustine says, they held to what they found in the church, they taught what they had learnt, what they had received from the fathers, they transmitted to the children. As the revealed doctrine of Jesus Christ embraces principally those things which we must believe and practice in order to obtain eternal life, so also does the authority of the fathers extend to whatever we have to believe and to practice in the work of our salvation. And as the binding authority of the teaching church has reference to things of faith and morals, so also is the decisive authorities of the consensus of the fathers likewise restricted with the same limits, outside of which no words of theirs require an unconditional assent. Whence it follows that the authority of the fathers is binding only when they all agree upon a question of faith and morals, or when the doctrine of an individual father is explicitly and definitely recognized or declared as a rule of faith by the universal church. In all other cases their authority is greater or less according to the arguments alleged in support of their opinion, and should never be lightly rejected. These restrictions will suffice, on the one hand, to prevent all subjective arbitrary use of the fathers in theology, and, on the other, to give as free and wide a scope as possible to scientific theology. Authority of the Fathers in Expounding Holy Scripture As the consent of the Holy Fathers represent the mind of the universal Church, which was infused into her by the Apostles, and which is identical with that intended by the Holy Ghost, it follows that the unanimous explanation of Holy Scripture given by the Fathers is of the same authority as that of the Church herself. It is therefore unlawful to depart or differ from it. St. Leo says, It is not lawful to understand Scripture otherwise than the blessed Apostles and our Fathers have learnt or taught. Again, the Council of Trent gives the following warning, Let no one, trusting to his own wisdom in matters appertaining to faith or morals and the building up of Christian doctrine, dare, by twisting the sacred scriptures to his own sense, to interpret them against the unanimous consent of the fathers. And the Vatican Council not only renewed this Tridentine decree, but also explained thus its full sense and bearing. In matters of faith and morals appertaining to the building up of Christian doctrine, that is to be held as the true sense of Scripture with Holy Mother Church has held and holds which office it is to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, and, therefore, no one is allowed to interpret that same sacred Scripture against this sense or against the unanimous consent of the Fathers. From these decrees of the Church we may deduce the following principles. 1. If the fathers, in expounding a passage, do not agree, it is lawful to explain it according to one's own well-grounded opinion. 2. The concordant explanation of Scripture by the Holy Fathers is binding only in subjects of faith and morals, but not in other scientific questions. 3. The degree of authority to be given to a father in the explanation of Holy Scripture is in proportion to his learning, sanctity, and the honor or approbation according to him by the Church. To St. Jerome belongs very special distinction and authority, for the Church speaks of him as her greatest teacher and the exposition of Holy Scripture.
in expondi sacri scripturis doctorum maximum. The authority of the fathers in aesthetic or pastoral theology. In order to determine their authority in these two branches of theology, we have to consider, in the first place, whether the principles laid down and the means pointed out by them for the guidance of souls are such as to have been either formally or explicitly, or at least implicitly, revealed by God. If that be the case, the Holy Fathers enjoy the like authority in aesthetic and pastoral theology as in questions of faith or morals. But when the principles and means set forth are merely based upon conclusions drawn from revealed truths, or founded upon psychological principles, or depending upon external circumstances, then the authority of the Fathers varies. In the first instance, it is very great indeed, for they were able to draw their conclusions from revealed truths with an assurance proportionate to their comprehension of the sacred truths. In the second instance, the authority is less, but still sufficiently grave, inasmuch as the writers had much experience, if not in theoretical, at least in practical psychology. In the third instance, much will depend upon whether the circumstances under which they lived and wrote are the same or similar to those of our times. If so, the principles and practical rules laid down by them still hold good. In the contrary case, the spirit, rather than the letter of their words, is to be studied and followed. Relation of the Fathers to Holy Scripture and the Church as regards the relations of the writings of the Holy Fathers to the sacred scriptures, we may say that though both have the same object, namely to explain revealed truths, and though both are acknowledged by the Church as trustworthy interpreters and witnesses of revelation, nevertheless there is a great and material difference between them. The sacred writers are one and all inspired, and each of their dicta represents infallible truth which is not the case with the fathers or their dicta. Translator's footnote. The author here is not quite explicit enough, but there is no doubt that he means to deny to the fathers both the gift of inspiration and the gift of infallibility in each particular statement. In translator's footnote. So far, the scriptures are immeasurably superior to the works of the fathers. On the other hand, the fathers, as the organs of tradition, treat of many things appertaining to faith which are not found in Holy Writ. Moreover, they unfold the contents of Holy Scripture in all their parts and show clearly how particular truths of faith are contained in the written word of God. Concerning the relations of the fathers and of Scripture to the Church, it may be said that both stand on the same level. For as the Church bears infallible witness to the fact of inspiration, and to the number of divinely inspired books, and unerringly explains their sense. So, in like manner, does she witness to and interpret with the same absolute infallibility the divine and apostolic tradition contained in the patristic writings. From this twofold source, the Church, under the guidance of the Holy Ghost, ever draws forth the truth and proposes it to the faithful as God's own word to be accepted and held with absolute certainty. Criticism in Patrology The Notion of Criticism Criticism in general may be defined as that science which teaches us how to distinguish truth from error. As applied to literary works, criticism means the knowledge and application of those rules by which we can distinguish the genuine and authentic from the spurious and substituted works of an author. Patrological criticism, therefore, has to set forth the principles which enable us to discern, with certainty, the genuine patristic works from the spurious, the certain from the doubtful, the complete from the curtailed and mutilated. This criticism is of paramount importance, owing to the existence of a great number of spurious and interpolated works of the fathers. According to authorship, a work is called genuine, if it has really been composed by the author, whose name it bears, spurious, or, or supposititious, if it has been ascribed to, or bears the name of, one who is not the author. 
doubtful when the author is uncertain and the reasons alleged for or against its genuineness are evenly balanced. According to its contents, a work is called genuine when it contains neither more nor less than the original. It is called not genuine or false either when it contains anything that has been inserted by a strange hand or when any part of it has been curtailed, suppressed, or omitted. It is styled entire or integral if no essential portion has been abstracted. The name of fragments is given to parts of a work, such writings as have been certainly written by some definite author, but have not been handed down to our own times, are called lost. With regard to form, the works of the fathers are either autographs, that is, written by their own hand, or originals, when only dictated by them. The transcriptions of the original works are called copies, and their value will depend upon their age and accurate correspondence to the original. They may exist in manuscript or in print. In the latter case, if simply printed, they are called codexes impressi. But if printed from a selection and comparison of a number of the best codexes, they are called codices editi, those that have been printed first being termed codexes principes. The Causes of Substitution, Interpolation, and Loss of Patristic Works One of the most frequent causes of substitution is to be found in the unscrupulous conduct of heretics who, in order to impart weight and authority to their false doctrines or to obtain easy currency for them, publish books under the names of celebrated fathers. As a second cause, we may name the blind and false piety of certain members of the church who thought they would render a service to her cause and refute heresies more effectively by composing orthodox works and passing them under the name of a father, or again, by giving to a modern production the weight and name of an old and renowned writer. A third cause of substitution was often the ignorance, fraud, and covetousness of copyists, who, when they found in one volume or collection various writings, together with those of a father, would not hesitate to ascribe them all to him, or again, confused authors of the same name, or even deliberately affixed to their own copies the more celebrated name of a father, in order to enhance their authority, reputation, and value. It has even happened that works were substituted for the mere pleasure of deceiving others, sometimes by a mere blunder, the persons introduced as chief actors or speakers in a work have been mistaken for its authors, especially in cases where the book bears the name of the principal actor, as in the Octavius by Minucius Felix. The interpolation of works may be due, first, to the malice of heretics, who have fraudulently introduced into them heretical sentences, or excluded those that were orthodox, secondly, to the temerity of critics, who have arbitrarily altered what did not suit their own ideas, thirdly, to the heedlessness of copyists, who often omit a line or copy entire passages incorrectly, finally, also, to time, which has been a fruitful source of alteration in the manuscripts during the long lapse of years. The loss of so many patristic writings is chiefly due to the evil influence of particular epochs of barbarism, to the accidents of war, devastations and fire, and especially in the case of the earlier writings, to the Christian persecutions. The Criteria or Marks of Genuineness and Spuriousness Those marks or criteria which enable us to judge of the genuineness or authenticity of a work are called the positive principles of criticism, and those by which we discover its spuriousness, the negative, both, again, are divided into internal and external marks, according as they are contained in the work itself, or are drawn from other sources. Among the external marks of genuineness, we may number, in the first place, the agreement of the various codices as to the author. If a number of codices, especially the more ancient one, indicate one and the same author, and if there be no special reason for attributing the work to a writer other than the one recorded on the title page, then the work must be considered as genuine. Exceptions to this rule may not be presumed, but have to be proved. A further external mark of authenticity is to be sought in the testimony of the author himself, 
or in that of any contemporary writer, as, for instance, a friend of his early days, or a pupil who is free from any suspicion of fraud. Such testimony is still more valuable if confirmed by subsequent trustworthy writers. The internal criterion for the genuineness of a work consists in the similarity of method and style, in the agreement of the contents, or subject matter, with the condition of the times when the book is supposed to have been written, and also with the temper, genius, character, and life of the author to whom it is attributed. This criterion, however, is not of itself absolutely decisive, but affords only a greater or less probability as the case may be. But if supported by external testimony, it is a safe and certain test of genuineness. The chief marks of spuriousness is to be found in the fact that a work does not harmonize with the style, character, and times of the supposed author. Thus, works which mention is made of persons, events, religious rites, and such like, which clearly belong to later times, are to be considered as spurious, or at least interpolated, and such as also the case if the style of composition differs strikingly from that of the father to whom the work is ascribed or from that of the period to which it is supposed to belong. Smaller variations of style, however, are not unusual in one and the same author. A further sign of spuriousness lies in the total absence of witnesses, i.e., documents in ancient writers. Thus, if a work bears the name of a certain author, while all existing manuscripts and codices mention another, it must be regarded as spurious. But if some codices mention one and some another, then the genuineness of the work is doubtful, and the same must be said of a work ascribed to a distinguished father, of which, in spite of many occasions, no mention is made for several centuries by any ancient writer. It must be observed, however, that this argument, drawn from silence, must always be employed with great prudence. Rules for the Application of Criticism in order to apply correctly the principles laid down above and more surely to discern the real author of a work, the following rules must be observed. 1. In the first place, we must carefully observe the name of the author given by the codices or manuscripts and then proceed to consider their antiquity, number, condition, and agreement. 2. In the next place, we have to see whether the contents of the works are in accordance with the mind and style of the author and with the time of composition. If any want of harmony be apparent, then the matter will require thorough examination. 3. Finally, the testimony of ancient writers is to be brought to bear upon the subject. If these rules be observed, and if they all point to one and the same conclusion, we are able to form a reliable and decisive judgment as to the author of a work. In order to carry out this examination in a proper manner, the patrologist should observe the following conditions. 1. Having collected and classed all the testimonies bearing on the point, he must accurately and impartially weigh and balance the reasons and arguments on both sides. 2. He must be intimately acquainted with the subject matter upon which he is to pronounce. That is to say, he must be thoroughly cognizant of the codices and their condition and peculiarities, of the history of the times, as well as of the language in which the documents were written. 3. In passing judgment upon any work, he must be animated with the purest love of truth, uninfluenced by personal preference or prejudice. The Use of the Fathers The Use of the Fathers in General The use of the Holy Fathers may be either public or private, according as they are used either by an assembled council of the Church and by the Pope when speaking ex cathedra, in his capacity of teacher of all the faithful, or merely by individual theologians. Their public use is generally restricted to matters of faith, morals, and church discipline and mainly serves to prove with absolute certainty the truth, when assailed or called in question, of the dogmas of the Church. Such an appeal to the Fathers necessarily supposes, as we have seen, their unanimity, but private use of the Fathers may be made for diverse ends and purposes, either to acquire a clearer knowledge of some dogmatic truth, and to prove and explain it more forcibly, 
or to obtain suitable moral precepts for various circumstances of life, or to find out the meaning of passages and portions of Holy Scripture. Thus, according to a fourfold purpose, we may distinguish the private use of the fathers as dogmatical, moral, aesthetical, or exegetical. Use in Matters of Dogma In matters of dogma, the Holy Fathers may be studied for the following purposes. 1. In order to draw from their works doctrinal truths, which, though not yet defined as articles of faith, could, nevertheless, not be denied or impugned without temerity. 2. In order to confirm and strengthen our faith by the testimony of Christian antiquity, and to guard against doctrinal innovations. 3. In order to understand thoroughly the fundamental dogmas of our salvation, such as the Blessed Trinity, the Incarnation, the Divinity of Christ and the Holy Ghost, and so forth, which have been treated with particular skill by certain fathers. 4. In order to render ourselves familiar with the arguments employed by the Holy Fathers, to prove the articles of faith and to defend them against heretics. 5. And lastly, in order to consider how the arguments by which heretics have impugned the various Catholic truths may be refuted both by authority and reason. Use in Morals and Aesthetics In morals, also, a rich harvest may be gathered from the works of the fathers, for they are replete with moral precepts and suggest motives for conduct and action. Some of the fathers, too, have written entire treatises on particular virtues, and laid special stress in their biblical commentaries upon the moral sense of Scripture passages. Nor are they of less service in the departments of aesthetical, pastoral, and homiletical theology. For those fathers who were conspicuous for their piety have left us most vivid and beautiful explanations in their writings, and especially in their letters, not only as to how each individual soul may direct itself, but also how others may be led, kept, and advanced in the way of Christian perfection. Again, from their homilies and sermons, we may learn how the truths of the faith can be explained and proved, and practically applied to the everyday life of the Christian. As, however, many of the remarks of the fathers are applicable only to the circumstances of the times in which they lived, their homilies must be judiciously chosen, and as far as possible, applied to the wants and moral conditions of our own time. Use in Biblical Exegesis It is usual to distinguish a twofold sense in Scripture, the literal and the figurative or typical, and accordingly, also, two kinds of interpretations. A. The literal or grammatical historical interpretation which considers the contents of Holy Writ according to the proper meaning of the words in light of the context and of the historical facts narrated. Translator's Footnote It would be more accurate to say, according to the literal meaning of the words, whether proper or metaphorical. The proper meaning is general opposed to the metaphorical, but the author does not take the word proper in the strict sense. End footnote. B. The figurative, or typical, or allegorical, mystical interpretations, which considers the contents of Holy Writ as signs, i.e., types and figures of grace, doctrine, and church of Christ, and of the future life. The fathers have not neglected or disregarded either of these two methods of explanation, but have cultivated them both. Some preferred one to the other, while others, more or less, combined the two. The fathers of the school of Antioch, specially cultivated the literal or historical interpretation, those of the Alexandrian school, the mystical. Others, like St. Chrysostom, St. Augustine, St. Gregory the Great, united both methods. The exegetical labors of the fathers are seen more particularly in their commentaries on Holy Scripture, also in their homilies in which they explain to the people certain portions of Scripture, or dwell upon some Scripture character, again, and their scolia, which were short explanations of difficult passages, or again, and prefaces and summaries to different books, 
or in answers and treatises about special portions or passages. Special mention should be made of what are called contene patrum, which are exegetical works, containing a running explanation of single passages of Holy Scripture extracted from various fathers. But as the quotations are not always authentic, it is necessary to consult and compare the better editions. The most celebrated of these works is The Golden Chain, a treatise on the four Gospels by St. Thomas Aquinas, consisting of selections from more than eighty Greek and Latin fathers. Selection of the Fathers The works of the Fathers being too numerous to be mastered by any single individual during his lifetime, a selection of the best and most suitable is therefore requisite. As a rule, we ought to read first those works of Fathers in which the doctrines of faith or morals are treated with great brevity and conciseness, or again, those that have been written for special states of life, and which may be read and understood without a great amount of theological or archaeological knowledge, as, for instance, the Commentorium of St. Vincent of Lorenz, the Confessions of St. Augustine, the Book de Sacredotto of St. Chrysostom, and the like. Those who are occupied or interested in the defense of Christian doctrines against the attacks of heathen and Jewish writers should choose the inestimable treaties of origin against Celsus, Contra Celsum, the Paparazio et Demonstratio Evangelica, or St. Eusebius the Apologetic, Apologicum, or Tertullian, the Institutionis of Licentius, and the writings of the Apologists, Justin, Mincius, Felix, Cyprian, and Honorbius. The following rank foremost as controversialists against heretics, Irenaeus against the Gnostics, Hippopleatus and Tertullian against the anti-Trinitarians, Jerome against Jovian, Vigilantius and Helvidius, John Damascene against the Iconoclasts. The student of dogma will find the most minute and acute disputations on the Trinity in the writings of Athanasius, Basil, Augustine, Hilary, and others the creation in the writings of Irenaeus, Gregory of Nyssa, Augustine, Basil, and Ambrose, the incarnation in Athanasius and Leo the Great, Grace in Augustine, the doctor of grace, Prosper and Felintius, the sacraments and especially the Holy Eucharist in Ambrose, Augustine, and Chrysostom, who is also the doctor of the Eucharist, and the church in Cyprian and Augustine. The subject of morals is treated by St. Basil and St. Gregory the Great in their books on morals, by St. Ambrose in his book De Officis, by St. Augustine in his letters. Then again, there are treaties on particular virtues, such as patience or charity by single fathers, as St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Basil, St. Chrysostom, or on particular vices as envy, de invidia, or on particular states as virginity, the priesthood de virginibus de sacerdotio. On monastic aestheticism, we have the works of Cassian, Basil, Marcurius the Great, and John Climaticus. For purpose of exegesis, the best principles of hermeneutics are contained in the prefaces of St. Jerome, and in his Apostolia ad Paulinum, as well as the books of St. Augustine de Doctrina Christiana. Upon church discipline, valuable explanations are given in the writings of the disciples of the apostles, the letters of St. Cyprian, St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great, etc. In homiletic subjects, the finest specimens are afforded by St. Chrysostom, St. Gregory of Nanzianzen, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Leo the Great, and St. Peter Chrysologus. Preliminary Conditions to Profitable Use Although the works of the Fathers, speaking generally, do not present such grave difficulties as the Holy Scriptures, yet a certain standard of moral and intellectual culture is requisite for the full and complete understanding of them. In order to read the Fathers with profit, it is necessary not only to hold them and their doctrines in the highest esteem, but also to have an intense love of truth and a deep attachment to Catholic principles, especially the rule of faith. 
For since the end and object of all study is to know the truth, there is no safer guide to direct our scientific pursuits than steadfast adherence to the principles and rule of faith. Moreover, as the fathers almost continually speak the language of Holy Scripture, the reader of their works must acquire an intimate knowledge of the sacred books, and also strive more and more to bring his mind into conformity with that of the fathers. He must, finally, implore the light of the Holy Spirit, that what has been written by his divine assistance may also be rightly comprehended by the aid of his illumination. THE MANNER AND WAY OF USING THE FATHERS To derive profit from the perusal of the Holy Fathers, the following rules should be observed. 1. Confine yourself to one work at a time, but read it carefully and repeatedly until you have grasped the main subject and method of treatment and are able at least to define the outlines or principal headings of both. 2. Endeavor to carefully impress upon your memory the leading points of the subject of the book. In this you will be greatly assisted by the practice of noting down the words of the author himself, his purpose and aim, his train of thought, and the course of his arguments or proofs. 3. Make a list of the more important passages, either in alphabetical order or in any other order that commends itself to you. 4. Pay great attention to the meaning of each word and to the sense of entire passages or treatises. As regards the meaning of words, it is to be noticed that the fathers make use of words both in the popular and in the philosophical sense of the times. Again, occasionally they do not employ words in the usual and proper sense, but in the sense given to them by heretics. Thus it may happen that they use one and the same word in quite different meanings. Furthermore, the literal and proper expressions are to be well distinguished from the figurative and metaphorical. In order to rightly apprehend the sense of a patristic word or particular passage, the following rules will be of help. 1. Consider well the aim and purpose of the work. Very often the true sense of a difficult passage may be gathered from the aim and object of the entire work. 2. See for whom or against whom the work is written, under what circumstances and upon what occasions. 3. Take also into consideration at what part or period of his life a father composed this or that work. 4. Try to explain obscure and doubtful passages by those which are clear and explicit occurring elsewhere in the writings of the same father or in the works of contemporary fathers. Incorrect or inaccurate passages of a father have to be interpreted in the light of the correct and accurate ones, and should be brought into harmony with the writer's general doctrine and orthodoxy of faith. But if it is impossible to harmonize them with the doctrine of the church, then they must be set aside with all due respect to the author. 5. We must discover whether a father is merely putting forth an opinion, a conjecture, an objection, or whether he is making a dogmatic statement. The following is an excerpt from The Blessed Virgin and the Fathers of the First Six Centuries by Thomas Livius, a priest of the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, published in 1893. Protestants, when controverting the doctrinal developments of the Catholic Church, are used to set much store by the well-known aphorism quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus, in order to show how ill this saying is often understood and how much it is misapplied, we think it well to quote at some length from the Commentorium of St. Vincent of Lorenz in which it occurs, and thus let the saint himself explain the meaning of his own words. We would first, however, say something about the author, the scope of his work, and the circumstances under which it was written. St. Vincent of Lorenz was a monk and a simple priest who lived during the fifth century. After being engaged, as it appears, in the military service, he retired into a monastery and devoted himself entirely to piety and the study of divine things. He wrote his Commentorium, not indeed with the view of laying down rules for the teaching body of the church, 
to follow when pronouncing decisions in matters of faith or morals, but for the security of his own faith, by recalling and having at hand the admonitions of holy men as to how private individuals and the simple faithful should behave in presence of prevalent heresies. The following are St. Vincent's own words. Quote, it is enough for me, in order to help my memory, or rather my forgetfulness, to have gathered together the common Tory, which, however, by calling to mind what in the past I have learned, I will endeavor with God's grace daily to correct and make more perfect. And this I have thought good to premise, that should this work of mine chance to get abroad and fall into the hands of holy persons, they may not over-hastily find fault with what they see in it, and which I promise ere long with later correction to amend and improve. St. Vincent's object was to enable himself, a simple monk, to discern the truth from the false teachings of heretics, on points which no decree of a general council could be found. Only three general councils had been held up to that time, the first at Nicaea in 325, the second at Constantinople in 381, and the third at Ephesus in 431. And these councils had not intended to declare in detail all that had been revealed, but only to affirm certain truths against contemporary heretics. He thus continues, quote, Whilst on making very earnest and diligent inquiries of many excellent, holy, and learned men, as to how and by what means I might securely, and by some, so to say, general and normal way, discern the truth of Catholic faith from the falsity of heretical pravity, I usually received this answer from them all, viz., that if I or any one else wished to find out the deceits of the heretics who were daily springing up, escape their snares, and remain safe and sound in the true faith, one must, with God's assistance, defend and preserve his faith in a twofold manner, first, by the authority of the divine law, and secondly, by the tradition of the Catholic Church. But since by reason of the very profundity of Holy Scripture, all do not understand it in one and the same sense, but diverse men diversely, one interpreting the same words this way, and another that, so that, to one's thinking, so many men, so many opinions may be gathered from it. Consequently, it is all of importance, in order not to be led away into the windings of every sort of error, to hold fast to the line of scriptural interpretation that is according to the rule of the ecclesiastical and Catholic sense. Within the Catholic Church itself, too, we should take great care to hold that which has been believed everywhere, and always, and by all. Quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus credentium est. For this is really and properly Catholic, as the very meaning of the words and reason show, and in a general way comprises everything. This, too, will be in fact the case if we follow universality, antiquity, and common consent. Universality, then, we shall follow if we confess that one faith as true, which the whole church throughout the world confesses. Antiquity, if in no way we depart from those sentiments which, it is manifest, our holy elders and fathers held and generally approved. Common consent, in fine, if we follow what were in antiquity the definitions and judgments of all, or, at any rate, nearly all the priests and teachers alike. End quote. Later on in his second commentary he says, quote, We have to pay most earnest heed to two things, unto which all those that will not be heretics must of necessity cling fast. The first is to see what has been decreed in old time by all the priests of the Catholic Church with authority of a general council. And secondly, should some new question arise about which no decree is to be found, we must then have recourse to the judgment of the Holy Fathers. End quote. Hence we see that St. Vincent, when in doubt whether doctrines, not yet defined by the Church, were Catholic or not, made it his rule to consult the writings of the Fathers. 
if he found from their testimony that a certain doctrine had been believed in the church ubique, that is, by faithful living in all parts of Christendom, semper, that is, from the apostles' days to his own time, ob omnibus, that is, by all those generally who were regarded as sound Catholics, or rather, what was held by the great majority of bishops and doctors, he at once concluded that such a doctrine was undoubtedly a genuine doctrine of Christian revelation, since it had been believed everywhere, always, and by all. But because all doctrines that have been believed, ubique semper et op omnibus, are undoubtedly genuine Christian doctrine, it is by no means follows that these are the only genuine Christian doctrines, nor, as we shall see, did St. Vincent himself thus conclude. Moreover, he goes on to qualify this general and ordinary rule that he had laid down. He supposes the case of heresy infecting not only some portion of the church, but going about to corrupt the whole church altogether, and of our seeing in antiquity that individual teachers, cities, and provinces have fallen into error. Here, he says, we must adhere to what the universal church has in council decreed. But, he asks, quote, what are we to do when it is some doctrine about which no such decree can be found? Then pains should be taken to consult and inquire as to what were the judgments and tenets after collating them together of the fathers, but of those only who, in different times and places, preserving in the communion and faith of the one Catholic Church, were regarded as approved teachers. And then, whatever we find, not one or two only, but all of them alike, with one and the same consent, openly, frequently, perseveringly, held and taught, this same we are to understand is to be believed by ourselves also without any further doubting. End quote. St. Vincent then goes on to speak of the prevalence of the Donatist schism in Africa, and of Arianism usurping the very place almost of the Catholic Church herself throughout Christendom, so that, quote, the minds of nearly all the bishops of the Latin tongue were shrouded in darkness, end quote, and describes the action of those bishops who most manfully opposed the widespread heresy as, quote, restoring nearly the whole entire world from a new perfidy to the ancient faith, from the madness of novelty to ancient soundness, from the blindness of novelty to the ancient light. End quote. He then recalls how, in a more remote age, quote, Agrippinius, Bishop of Carthage, of venerable memory, end quote, and even quote, the most blessed Cyprian, that light of all saints, bishops and martyrs, end quote, sanctioned the sacrilegious practice of rebaptizing heretics, and thus gave occasion to Catholics of falling into error. So great, he says, quote, was the ability and force of argument with which the heresy was supported, so powerful the eloquence, so large the number of its advocates, such its plausibility and appearance of truth, so many the passages of holy writ cited in its behalf, though clearly interpreted in a new and wrong sense, end quote, that for himself he does not think the plot could have been put down in any other way than by denouncing it with being a novelty. And this, says St. Vincent, quote, Pope Stephen, the bishop of the Apostolic See, most effectually did by the decree, Nikil Novandum, Nisi quod traditium est, contained in the epistle which he sent to Africa. For, whilst taking counsel with his colleagues, the Pope felt himself bound as much to surpass all the other bishops in devotion to the faith, as he was above them all by the authority of his place. End quote. Here there was no general counsel to define, and yet St. Vincent evidently looks upon the judgment of St. Stephen as final, and deciding what was the Catholic truth to be believed on the question at issue. He speaks of the subsequent, quote, African Council, with its decree, as, God so granting it, being of no force, and the whole matter become in the end as though a dream, or a tale, that is told, 
superfluous, done away, antiquated, trodden underfoot. End quote. In summing up what was done for the condemnation of Nestorianism, St. Vincent marks out the authority of the Roman pontiff in the following words, quote, All which things, though they were abundant for the overthrow and the extinguishing of all the profane novelties, yet, lest aught should be lacking to such fullness, we add for a conclusion a twofold authority of the apostolic see, the one of the holy Pope Sixtus, the venerable man who now adorns the Roman Church, the other of his predecessor of blessed memory, Pope Celestine, which we have thought so necessary here to insert. End quote. Thus we see that, according to the teaching of St. Vincent, a doctrine may be thoroughly Catholic, and yet may not in every case, as that of not rebaptizing heretics, have been held ubique et ab omnibus. But there remains the word semper. Those who hold to the interpretation and application of St. Vincent's rule, as it is commonly understood by non-Catholics, would maintain that all genuine doctrines of Christianity originally contained in the revealed deposit were believed in the same manner, that is, to say, explicitly, at any rate, more or less so, in every age of Christianity from the beginning, at least by some few, and somewhere in the Church. We would now then show that St. Vincent held that the teaching and belief of Christian doctrines was not always the same, or, in other words, that alongside of the principle, quod ubique, quod semper, quod ab omnibus, there was, according to the saint, a process of doctrinal development in the Church, whereby additions were made to Catholic teachings, and certain Christian truths that are one time had been believed only implicitly, came in course of time to be believed explicitly. For this purpose we shall simply give a lengthened quotation from the Commentorium, thus leaving St. Vincent to explain his teaching on the matter in his own words. Quote, o Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words. Who at this day is Timothy, but either generally the universal church, or especially the whole body of prelates, who ought either themselves to have a sound knowledge of divine religion, or who ought to infuse it into others. What is the depositum custodi? What is the depositum? It is that which has been entrusted to thee, not what has been found out by thee, what thou hast received, not what thou hast thought out, a matter not of ingenuity, but of learning, not of private adoption, but of public tradition, a thing brought to thee, not brought out by thee, wherein thou must be not an author, but a keeper, not an originator, but a pursuer, not leading, but following. Keep, he says, the deposit. Preserve the talent of the Catholic faith, inviolate and pure. Let what has been entrusted to thee remain with thee, be delivered by thee. Thou hast received gold, give back gold. I will not that thou offer me one thing for another, and have the face, instead of gold, to present me with lead, or cheat me with brass. I want not the appearance of gold, but its reality. O Timothy, O priest, O steward, O doctor, if the divine gift has rendered thee fit by thy wit, thy travail, thy doctrine, be the basile of that spiritual tabernacle, engrave the precious gems of divine dogma, Faithfully set them, wisely adorn them, give them brightness, grace, and beauty. Make what was before believed more obscurely, by thy exposition, to be more clearly understood. Let posterity rejoice for coming to the intelligence of that, by thy means, which antiquity, without understanding it, had in veneration. Nevertheless, the things thou hast learned, the same teach in such sort, that, albeit thou speakest after a new manner, thou speak not new things. But some will perhaps say, Is there then no progress of religion in Christ's church? Surely there is. Yea, let us have progress, even the greatest. For who would be so envious to men, so hateful to God, as to seek to hinder it? 
but yet of such sort it should be, as to be in good truth a progress of faith, not a change thereof. It is of the nature of progress that the particular thing should itself be amplified, but of change that something should be turned from one thing into another. Therefore the understanding, the science, the wisdom ought to increase, and make much and strenuous progress, as well as every man in particular, as of all in common, as well and in the successive stages of a man's life, as in the various ages and times of the whole church, but yet, for all that, only in its own kind and nature, that is to say, in the same doctrines, in the same sense, in the same judgment. Here let the religion of our souls imitate the way of our bodies, which, although as years go by, they develop and unfold their proportions, yet remain the same that they were. There is a great difference betwixt the flower of youth and the ripeness of age, yet the self-same men become old who once were young, so that although the state and condition of one and the self-same may be altered, yet one and the self-same nature, one and the self-same person, still remain. Small are the limbs of infants, great of young men, yet they are the same. So many joints as young children have, so many they that when they are men, and if there are any parts that put forth in course of more nature age, there were already planted after the manner of seed, so that nothing in old men afterwards come forth new, which did not already lie hid in them before, when they were children. In like manner also it befits the doctrine of the Christian religion to follow these rules of progress, so that it may thus be consolidated in course of years, developed by time ennobled by age, and still preserved incorrupt and pure, and in all the proportions of its several parts, and so to say, in all its particular limbs and senses, become full and perfect, and this without admitting aught of alteration, or sustaining any loss of what essentially belongs to it, or any variation of definition. For example, our fathers sowed of old in the church's fields the seeds of wheat and faith. Very unjust and improper would it be that we, their descendants, instead of the genuine truth of wheat, should gather the counterfeit error of cockle. This rather is right and reasonable, that, without discrepancy between the first and the last, from the successive growth of the original wheat, we also should reap a harvest of wheat and doctrine, so that, whilst there is some evolution in course of time, from those first seminal principles, it is now fertilized and improved, yet nothing be changed from the nature of the germ. Though there be outward shape and appearance, form distinction, yet the nature of each kind remains still the same. For God forbid that the rose gardens of Catholic sense should be turned to thistles and thorns. God forbid, I say, that in this spiritual paradise, from shoots of cinnamon and balsam, should suddenly sprout forth darnel and wolfsbane. Whatever then has been sown in the church, the husbandry of God, by the faith of our fathers, let this same flourish and ripen, let this same make progress and be brought to perfection. For right it is that those pristine doctrines of heavenly philosophy should in process of time be worked up, finished, and polished. But it is most wrong that they should be changed about, most wrong that they should be maimed and mutilated. Let them by all means receive evidence, light, distinction, but they must keep their fullness, integrity, and what naturally belongs to them. But the Church of Christ a careful and wary keeper of the doctrines committed to her charge, never changes anything in them, diminishes nothing, adds nothing. What is necessary she takes not away, what is superfluous she puts not on, loses not her own, usurps not what belongs to others, but with all industry takes pain about this one thing alone, that by faithful and prudent handling of what is old, should there be some things of old time rough cast and incohet, 
she may bestow care on and polish them. If things are already expressed and inculcated, she may consolidate and strengthen them. If they are already confirmed and defined, she may guard them. What else, in fact, has the church labored for by the decrees of councils, but that what before was simply believed should latter on be more carefully believed, that what was before more sluggishly preached should be later on preached with greater instance, that what was before reverence with too much unconcern might latter on be reverence with more solicitude. This I say, and not else but this, has the church, when stirred up by the novelties of heretics, affected through the decrees of councils, namely, that which she had before received from those of old, by tradition alone, the same she has consigned for those who came afterwards in written form also, thus comprising a large sum of matters in few words of writing, and, for the most part, on account of the clear light in which the doctrine was now understood, designating it, though in no new sense of faith, by specific and new appellation. This has been a production of Alleluia Audiobooks. For more free Catholic audiobooks, please visit us at alleluiaaudiobooks.com or you can Google Alleluia Audiobooks. This CD is free to make copies of and distribute to your family and friends, but we do ask you to not make alterations to the original audio. Thank you, and God bless.